Welcome to Worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church in Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with this congregation, along with the members and friends, children and youth of all ages and at all stages of life. We are committed to being with each other as we face the great questions of how to live a life of meaning, how to love inclusively, how to grow in mind, body, and spirit, and how to do our part to create a more just, more whole world. Welcome. It is good to be together. Now, our welcome also includes honoring our past. These are the ancestral lands of the Peoria people. They created their lives here long before we arrived. Now, for all of our ministries, online and in person, this congregation supports itself largely on the gifts of time, talent, and financial donations of its members and friends. Regular financial gifts sustain the mission of the congregation in all the ways that we gather. The link to make a donation is in the chat, and it is also in the slide at the end of the service. Now, if you are a guest or a visitor, thank you for joining us today. Please help us get to know you. All are welcome to coffee hour after service on Zoom. And as of this Sunday, today, we are starting to gather in person back in the building. You're welcome to join us in person as well. If you'd like the link for the separate Zoom in the chat, that's in the chat and in the slide at the end of the service. Contact us through the website for more information. Now, today's worship is something special. We are honoring Juneteenth, and Juneteenth marks the day of June 19th, 1865, when the enslaved population in Texas heard the news of their freedom as declared in President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. This congregation is predominantly white, and the institution and the faith um, benefit from white supremacy. Now, part of our effort to create a more just and more whole world, it is incumbent upon us to learn and reflect on bias, oppression, and its impact. To recognize such a day as Juneteenth, uh, we are fortunate to share voices from those who are of African descent uh, and to share them from around central Illinois in cooperation with our sibling congregations in Urbana-Champaign and in Decatur. So I want to invite you in for a special service uh, in honoring this, what is this newest state and federal holiday as of this week. Welcome. It is good to be together. Let us begin in our worship. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. Oh, for each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. Oh, for each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. of courage, fathers of time, daughters of dust, and the sons of great visions, we're sisters of mercy, brothers of love, lovers of life, and the builders of nations, we're seekers of truth, keepers of faith, makers of peace, and the wisdom of ages, we are our grand prayers we are our grandfather's dreamings and we are the breath of our ancestors we are the spirit of god we are mothers of courage fathers of time Daughters 
valleys of dust and the signs of great visions we sisters of mercy brothers of love lovers of life and the builders of nations we seekers of truth and keepers of faith we are makers of peace and the wisdom of ages we are our grandmother's prayers we we are our grandfather's dreamings and we are the breath of our ancestors we are the spirit of god we are our grandmother's prayers and we are our grandfather's dreamings we are the breath of our ancestors we the spirit of God for each child that's born. A morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. We are Our opening words today are by Heidi Cottom. It is entitled, This Faith. Let us be a faith that gathers, reaching for one another through the walls of hate others build, through the cages of ignorance and arrogance, and through the fear that burns city streets. Let us be a faith that sees a vision of a better world, more compassionate, more just, more holy, and with more love. There is a faith that binds up the broken, cauterizes battle wounds with the balm of peace, sings louder and longer than the trumpets of war. Let us be that faith too. Let us be the ones who do not tread lightly in this world, but light it up with our love who hold up the mirror of worth and dignity, who are the sanctuary others seek. But first, let us be a faith that worships together. Here, this morning, in this space, at this moment, let us be a faith. The chalice is a symbol by Deborah Falk. A chalice lit in our midst is a symbol of our liberal faith, a faith built on the foundation of freedom, reason, and tolerance, a faith sustained by acts of kindness and justice, a faith that visions a world flourishing with equality for all her people, a faith that demands the living out of goodness, a faith that requires thoughtfulness, a faith of wholeness. This tiny flame is the symbol of the spark of all of this within each of us. Jewish scholar Abraham Heschel reminds us, the prayer cannot bring water to parched fields, nor mend a ruined bridge, or rebuild a broken city. But prayer can water an arid soul, mend a broken heart, and rebuild a weakened will. In this time, we create a place for rebuilding through the sharing of joys and sorrows among us. I want to thank Shar Ricky for gathering the concerns of this week. So let us begin with sympathy. We offer our heartfelt sympathy to Sherry Dearborn as she grieves the loss of her cousin, Ted Lane, who was at age 72, uh, died in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. We also send our thoughts of care and concern to Sherry and her family as one of her dearest young cousins undergoes surgery. Now let us continue our wishes for health. Uh, we send healing wishes to Jim Close as he recuperates at home from a woodworking injury. We also send healing wishes to Keith Berry as he recuperates from two surgeries, one that was on June 7th and another on June 17th. 
Now I want to close this congregation's joys and sorrows with a note of thanks. Uh, that the church picnic on uh, June 13th was a great event. Thank you so much to Marianne Shin and the entire hospitality team. Thank you to Martha Herm and Tar Tom McIntyre for hosting all of us crowding into your farm. And thank you very much to everyone who participated, brought food, or just joined in the fun of the day. It was so good to have a chance to be together uh, in, in celebration, in joy, and in such good spirit. I want to turn to our larger world um, in addition to the celebration of Juneteenth that this weekend marks the summer solstice where many of us honor uh, the power of our great cosmic systems that we are within and often subjected to um, that is such meaning to understand and engage with the light with the sun with what it can, the gifts that that can bring into our lives. But in recognizing the solstice, we're also mindful of those who are suffering uh, from heat and from the continuing and growing problems in our climate. Let us offer our wishes for uh, that we may regard and take seriously, yet again, our stewardship of the earth. We also honor Father's Day, uh, often a day to cherish those who cherish others uh, and do so in so many ways, as a parent, as a teacher, a mentor, a coach, a friend. But we also, in recognizing Father's Day, uh, know that there is so much sorrow for those who did not have the love they wanted or needed from the people in their lives. And we also support the courage of those who find ways to parent in the face of bias against those who are transgender, non-binary, and so many other identities that are not typical of the father. We honor Father's Day with full hearts for all who cherish and for all who nurture. And I also must name that this week, our country, the United States, recorded 600,000 deaths from COVID-19. There is so much loss. There is so much sorrow. And it becomes even more complicated as we begin to open up in our society and continue to move forward. I want to recognize all those who have struggled, all those who have lost, those close to us and those we probably will never meet. So much is complex. We mourn, we remember, we celebrate, and we call each other to our best selves. In that fullness, let us offer one more moment for all of the joys, the sorrows, the names and the milestones that live within our hearts and are unspoken. In this common place and time, the community is with us in all the ways we gather. Our joys are amplified when they are known, and our, so our burdens lightened when they are shared. Let us hold one more moment in quiet and breathe. Amen. Today's worship is in honor of Juneteenth. This is the day when Union troops, uh, made up of black soldiers, including some from Peoria, arrived at Galveston, Texas on June 19, 1865. They brought the news of freedom to the enslaved people. President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation had been read two and a half years prior to their arrival at Texas. And yet, it took so long for them to get there and for that news to get there. In fact, it took the Union troops arriving there to enforce this proclamation. Juneteenth is a day of celebration, of freedom, and of the, the next phase of the end of slavery in this country. 
For this reflection, I want to offer, uh, introduce the service and acknowledge the generous contributions that made it possible. I need to begin, however, with the terrible reality that is the source of this holiday. I turn to the words of my colleague, the Reverend Kristen Harper. She is the second woman of African descent to be called by Unitarian Versalist congregation through our regular search and settlement process. I want to take note of her place in our faith's history um, as the second woman called in our regular search process um, because she and I are about the same age and we also entered the ministry at about the same time. It took until the early 2000s for the second woman of African descent to be called by a Unitarian Versalist congregation. I want to help us keep that in mind as we go forward and consider the impact of racism and oppression on all of us. Its impact is deep in so, in so many ways. For this first reflection, I want to make some connections between the impact of racism and why Juneteenth is so meaningful. And I think bringing Reverend Harper's words into this um, is the place to begin. And she describes uh, when slavery began in this country. Her piece is called The Deep Well of Black Lives. On August 25th, 1619, the ship, the White Lion, arrived at Point Comfort, now known as Fort Monroe National Monument in Hampton, Virginia. The ship contained enslaved Africans. And this is the first recorded arrival of Africans in America. In 2019, this anniversary was commemorated at Fort Monroe as a day of healing and reconciliation. The community was asked to ring bells at 3 p.m. for four minutes, signifying the 400 years that have passed since that historic landing. And she goes on. How do we mark the day, that first day, that hour, that minute, when the white lion docked at a point that would be of no comfort to 20 enslaved Africans chained in her bowels? heralding the coming storm of millions whose bodies would break through soil and rock to build an America that could never fully embrace its progenitors. How do we mark that day, that hour, that minute that foreshadowed the centuries of degradation, of violence, of attempt to separate the soul and the spirit from the deep well of black lives? How do we mark the day, that hour, that minute, for a hundred years ago, when the first drop of African sweat co-mingled with the earth's warmth, planting seeds of a new culture, a new way of life, a new heartbeat into the fabric of the world, where the roots of freedom sparked deep underground and spread from generation to generation, blossoming resistance and resilience. So today, we will ring bells of sorrow, bells of grief, bells of atonement. We will ring out the ghosts of those lost in the middle passages, lost to the whips and deprivation, lost to the lynches and the bullets, lost to the, pris the prisons and the chains of racism. Today, we will ring bells so that tomorrow we may ring in freedom ring in liberation, and ring in peace. Here ends her words. That landing in 1619 is the point of origin for our path to Juneteenth. We have a chance to take seriously this history as we enter into learning about what freedom means for people of African descent. The service is not our celebration of such a holiday. It is an opportunity 
to hear the story and the experience from people who have chosen to share and reveal their life and their truth as bound and wound as it is in history with today, with yesterday, with bias, with devastating and ongoing injustice, and also with liberation and with the perseverance of the human spirit. And I acknowledge the great gifts that make this service possible. From Reverend Florence Kaplow with the Unitarian Universalist Church of Urbana-Champaign for putting together the interview with local leaders Don Blackman Sr. and Candy Foster. Reverend Kaplow offered the use of this interview to the Central Illinois congregations who had been part of the recent study of racism in our Unitarian Universalist institutions. I also want to thank Sharon Samuels Reed, the founder and artistic director of the Heritage Ensemble, for permission to include their production of Make Them Hear You, which featured soloist Michael Hurt. But now we have a special piece of music from the Stanford Talisman Alumni Virtual Choir and their production of Lift Every Voice and Sing. Civil rights activist James Weldon Johnson wrote Lift Their Voice and Sing as a poem, which was set to music by his brother John Roseman Johnson in 1899. The song is now known as the Black National Anthem in America. It is a protest, a hymn, and a prayer of profound significance for our people. We lift every voice and sing to express ourselves. We lift every voice to show that we have strength in numbers and we will not be silent. We lift every voice and sing to be lifted, liberated, and free. Freedom, the power to determine action without restraint. Freedom, the absence of or release from ties, obligations, or restrictions. Freedom, the ease or facility of movement or action. Freedom, frankness or boldness in manner or speech. Freedom, a political right. Until we are all free, none of us is free. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Lift every voice and sing.
Our featured voices are in an interview conducted by the Reverend Florence Kaplow with two community leaders from Urbana-Champaign. Don Blackman Sr. is the garden steward for the Randolph Street Community Garden, what had been started as a graduate project and is now continued by the University of Illinois Master Gardeners. This garden is an oasis of fresh produce in a food desert in North Champaign. Candy Foster is a blues musician who is located in Champaign-Urbana for the past 40 years. I invite you to listen to their conversation about Juneteenth. And the music that follows the, inter the interview is This Little Light of Mine, a song often sung on Juneteenth. So it originated from South, right? Texas. Texas. Oh, yeah, that's Texas. even better. Because it was two years before the army got there to tell them they were free. <laughs> I'm getting it now. I'm getting so it. So it's kind of like they kept being enslaved two yeah. years after the end of the war. Yeah. And finally, um, they sent troops out across the way to tell people that they were free. And there are some really interesting accounts online about people who were um, interviewed during um, one of the WPA things and, the, and one lady said that she and her mom, the minute they heard that they were free, packed up their things and left. <laughs> and, and just, they were that much of a hurry to get away. They were, oh, wanted yeah. to try and catch up and find family members that were gone oh. and missing. But um, it was called Jubilee at first. Mm. So it was, it was, oh, it was, I see. Yeah, it was called a Jubilee. Proportions. Yes, yeah. it was called Jubilee at first. And just, you know, it's evolved. Mm -hmm. um, just in 2007, Juneteenth got its own flag. You yeah. know, before, well, people great. were using that's the red, thing. black, and green, but uh -huh. someone d d made up a um, Juneteenth flag that's a single star illuminated on a blue and red background. And then they added the date to it just recently. Oh, so, but it, oh, it's, like I said, it, it evolves, and there's all kinds of things that go on. I mean, we're having a parade, but a lot of Juneteenth celebrations have parades. Right. It's um, a, is it uh, um, kind of like a, just on a, a lower level, like a main volume? Uh, like a Mardi Gras, but but you know, in a different more sense. like a Fourth of July parade because okay. it's you know it's the same celebration. Okay. Okay. Right. Independence. <laughs> Independence. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And, that and, would be and, right. Uh, okay. So the you celebrate everybody celebrates Juneteenth, 
everybody everybody celebrates Fourth of July. Everybody can celebrate Juneteenth. You yeah. know, because well, you know, if all of us aren't free, none of us are free. There weren't so much um, the community celebrations. It was in the backyard barbecues and right. maybe the church would have something. But it was primarily a day when people were encouraged to help people get registered to vote. Mm. Even from the very beginning, the first celebration. And there was a celebration yeah. the first year after. And, but it took a while for it to like move north. Because as people left Texas and moved to other parts of the South, it spread that way. And then when people started to move north from the South was when it kind of populated the northern states. We didn't have, you know, people didn't have email. No, <laughs> so no. It that, took a while. Email, we had the town crier. <laughs> Maybe that's why it took two years for yeah. it to get to Texas, although I think there might be another story there. I think there. they might have just been keeping mum about it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a, it's kind of a thing that the word of mouth and, and neighborhoods, mm -hmm. you know, barbershops, black barbershops. Yep, beauty and, shops. And beauty shops. And all those, a whole lot happens and a whole lot of messages gets out that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some takes a little longer than others, but it all depends. Yeah, yeah back with when it, on that kind of particular day, sometimes we had to not open the bars up until later on, or things like that. <laughs> you know? Well, and it was always celebrated on the 19th. It didn't yeah. float around to the closest Saturday. So it was just, it was one of those fixed days, like the 4th of July. It doesn't yeah. matter if the 4th of July is on Sunday or Wednesday, yeah. it's still the 4th of July. That's right. So. I always believed in that too, because, you know, if that's what it's supposed to be, then that's what it is. You can't. You know, I, I don't want. I don't want Christmas uh, being changed. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't. Now you know that ain't the way it's supposed to be. You know. So I, I'm kind of like that, and I, I just kind of. I'm an old traditional person, and I believe in that very much. So. So. Well, we're partnering with Dream this year. They're. Um, we're having, we're going to have a red food feast because red food was one of the things that um, bond people didn't get to eat. I mean, you, you grew strawberries for the big house, but you were in trouble if you were caught with strawberry breath. You, um, same thing with watermelon and, and yeah. other berries and things. If you found some wild, then that, that was a possibility, but usually the big house got the, the, part, the, crop the, plant, the eating yeah. part of the plant. They yeah. got the beets, we got the tops. Yeah. Okay, so when, um, and when Juneteenth, when Jubilee came in celebration, they ate all of the things that they hadn't been able to eat mm -hmm. freely before. And um, it was, the red color was important because it just symbolized all the strength and the blood. I see. So. Yeah. Very good, very good. So that's part of how you do the, the Juneteenth, is like yeah. to do a red food. Well, it makes well, sense you're in the garden, too. Right, and yeah. because, well, like our, straw, our, our strawberries won't be ready, but our cherry tree is ready. Uh -huh. And this cherry tree we planted in memory of Kiwan Carrington. So all that's week true. long, my workers have been picking cherries. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every day there's another batch ripe, so I'm going to take them and have a cherry cobbler made. And they'll wow. probably be red velvet cake. Uh, yeah, ooh, I, love red, <laughs> okay. I love red velvet cake. I like red velvet cake too, but I make mine with beets because I don't like number 10 red dye. <laughs> right, I, I probably can handle that. <laughs> but uh, so, yes, that's, it's going to be a celebration. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. the, the, um, I read one article that said the people in the South said that they can pick cotton, they don't need other jobs. Yeah. And so they were relegated to picking cotton or leaving to come and get yeah. to do other jobs. Yeah, you know, it, it went on and on, even at, even into the later years. And you go into schools, and we had black schools, and then we had, and then you had to go eventually go to um, primary white school, and, and well, where teachers were there and. You know, when the kids come in, I had a cousin of mine that 
that tell me told me a story a couple of times. He said he went to start thinking about it. He said, "Man, I I need to start doing something because I want to go to college, and I got to get my classes." Right. He said, "Then he talked to a couple of ex teachers, and and they told him about, yeah, you need to go and find out about that." He said he went into the principal's office and and uh, asked him about it. He said, "What can I do for you?" He said, "I need to know." Come next semester, I, what kind of classes I need to be taking? Cause I'm, I want to go to college. And, and he said, principal said, said, got up and said, boy, what's wrong with you? He said, you ain't going to college. You just going to do like the rest of you. You know, you going on out to General Motors or one of them uh, the foundries or one of them uh, construction work camps. And work. You ain't got no time to be going to college. He said, well, "What can I go?" I said, no, no. You don't have the aptitude for it. You can't do it. And he said, "I left out there." He said, first I was I felt like crying, but then I got thought of thinking about it." He said, "It just downright made me mad." <laughs> and he said, "Don't tell me I can't I can't do a college." So make a long story short, that was my cousin, and 50 or 60 years later, he just retired from being the national president of the Teachers Association. Ah. <laughs> I love yeah. it. That's something else. I wonder if he ever went back to that principal and said, "Yes, look." Oh yeah. yeah. I asked him, but he said, "I wish I could have." But he yeah. <clears throat> well, that's one thing too. Stories are shared, uh -huh. you yeah. know, from that time, and then people share stories of their life, uh, their livelihood. I know, um, talking about going back and talking to the principal, May Jamison, the uh, first African American woman in space. Yeah was in the, we were in school the same time, although I was in Catholic school, but mm -hmm. they didn't have enough spaces in the honors math and science programs at Harlan High School where she went. And you had to take a test and you got assigned a space according to your test. Right. Well, she scored first in both of them, but the principal called her in and asked her to relinquish her slot because, quote, as the African-American female, she would not be able to adequately utilize that education. And she refused. Well, long and short of it, she became a doctor, and then she went into space, and the school had May Jemison Day when she came back. Yeah. <laughs> and guess who was, it was the, math, the head of the math and science depart, the uh -huh. department that counseled her to give up her spot. Guess who was principal? That guy. That guy. And guess who she busted out big time during the... <laughs> I wonder why. Yeah, and, so, and she told the, the students, don't let anybody else's lack of imagination direct yeah. your life. So there's always, there's stories in every generation like that. Oh yeah, it's and, all kind of stuff. You know, uh, there's a lot of stories that, that people we know and and the people we're around can tell stories about. It just is not story; they just facts mm -hmm. <laughs> that what happened. You know? I really felt feel blessed because I had an aunt who lived to be just short of her hundred and seventeenth birthday. Oh. Okay, she was wow. nine years old when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. And so she... And you knew her. I knew her. When, when she was in her 90s, she came to live with us because she broke a hip. And she came and stayed with us while she recovered. And she was full of stories. She had all oh, kinds of man, stories to tell. Did. And I stayed up under her. I mean, if she sat down, I was at her feet. You know, because she knew she was the oldest. She knew everybody's story. She knew what... Who, who was buried where, she knew who died, how they died. She knew who was going to college, who, who went to college years before, you know, and what they, they took up, 
was the phrase she always used. But yeah, Man. I was felt really blessed to have been able that's, to that's a gold know mine her. <laughs> to know her, yeah. yes. That's extraordinary to think like that's only like that you knew her and she was alive at the time of the and, and I was ten yeah, is and she was nine when and she was telling me stories yeah. about herself yeah. as an enslaved child. You know, so I could say that was just Last year, that was me. I was nine, you know? Yeah. And so it was, I just really relished that time, cherished that time. But yeah, anybody, it's, it's kind of like somebody asked, well, because I said, you know, I've got, I've got church groups that want to come and celebrate with us. I think it's great. And somebody said, well, how do you feel about that? I said, everybody can celebrate Juneteenth. Okay, we can celebrate that final freedom because it meant that everybody was free. Yeah. Right. Well, that's what it should be. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, we celebrate Fourth of July. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> okay. that's right. That's Even what... though it didn't include us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there's something. To think about. Yeah, you know, but my, you know, the one thing that I can't say about black people, they didn't really care if it didn't include them. They were determined to be a part of something mm -hmm. because they. They paid their dues to be a part of it, and they they, they stuck it out. Yeah. Look at George, you know George Washington. He he <laughs> borrowed some folks to go to war with. So I mean, if you look at that famous painting of him crossing the Delaware, there's an African American soldier in the boat with them. Yeah. Okay. Every despite every war, you, they, every they, war they can put up there, but it just it goes to show you that you know. No matter how hard some people would no, want to deny you and, and, and defy you of what, what's yours and what's your heritage and what's going on in, in this country or in this world, they, they can't do it. It's going to pop up. And the thing and is, no matter what. There's a Ghanaian proverb that shows, it goes with this Dinkra symbol that two crocodiles, like a co-joined crocodiles. They have one stomach, but they have two heads, two tails, and eight legs. Right. And the proverb that goes with it says, sharing one stomach, yet they fight for food. Yeah. There must be unity where there is one destiny. That's exactly where we are right now. Yeah. Because we are linked in inextricably. Okay, there's no way to get around that, over it, under it. So we have to be on the same team. And we always, yeah. the only way we've ever been successful in anything that's worth anything is what we had to come together. Mm -hmm. Separated, we cannot win. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, oh, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Building up a world, I'm gonna let it shine. Building up a world, I'm gonna let it shine. Shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Juneteenth comes to us this year as a newly signed state and federal holiday. Many people have raised concerns about what can be mere symbolism of making this day a holiday when 
so much oppression remains in our society and in our hearts. Why not spend more time on bias in policing, on bias in our healthcare systems, on economic injustice, and so on, and reparations before making a holiday? And this week, we once again fight for voting rights uh, in supporting the For the People Act, uh, which exists in part in response to efforts to restrict access to voting. And these restrictions will impact those in marginalized communities in particular. So why the holiday? Well, we need a chance to learn. I spent 12 years in Texas with little to do with Juneteenth. I thought it was not my community. And as I have done my homework for the service, I realized there is an entire world of celebration and history and legacy of which I was not aware. And I need to know, I need to know about Juneteenth as part of this sacred work, as I need to know this as a person and as a minister. And I think we all need to know this as a congregation and as a faith. Advocate Brian Stevenson reminds us to get proximate, to build relationships, and to do so with intention and humility. So in recognizing Juneteenth, we, make, we do our small part to move that forward just a little bit more. But there is also other voices who have been honoring the people who have been pushing for this holiday their entire lives. There are elders in the black community who were descended from those in Texas and from across the South. They understood the value of visibility and worth of bringing this celebration with all of its history and all of its complexity of bringing this celebration into the lives of the nation. And so we honor this holiday out of respect for their intent and their spirit as well. As my colleague, the Reverend Teresa Soto reminds us, all of us need all of us to make it. So let us receive the history and the celebration that we have received about Juneteenth. Let us receive that into our hearts that we may make its spirit and its message manifest in our lives as we go forth. We close with music from the Heritage Ensemble, Make Them Hear You, featuring the soloist, Michael Hurt. Yeah. 
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And from my colleague, Rebecca Savage. Spirit of life, spirit of love, we have gathered under the banner of a shared faith. We are born of a welcoming grace that extends and receives love. We are touched by the ways we have fallen short of who we strive to be. And we are here, we're born, forged by a greater courage. So let us move from this place, encouraged and refreshed for the journey ahead. Our worship is ended, let our service begin. We extinguish this flame.